from her son, daughter-in-law, and precious granddaughter. So, without further delay, I'm going to delay just a little bit because I really wanted to say thank you to David Dari County for um, providing us with this opportunity in the middle school to give our, all of our children an opportunity to succeed even more. We just had um, we just had a session with the teachers. It was their second session. They have lots of questions, and um, it's great to watch the team work collaboratively towards making ensuring that there is consensus that what's happening in all of our classes. Oh, sorry, what's happening in each classroom is really consistent across the board because we know that when there's that consistency, in addition to all of the all of the different um, approaches, that consistency will really allow our children to understand and to, to really move a little bit more speed in terms of comprehending information and processing information. So thank you again for that. And uh, the faculty is really excited about it, and we have some follow-ups as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when I talked to to, uh, to Dana about doing this program for the school, um, one of the things we discussed was the fact that the friends that she had in common with me, um, it really mattered that the, the, the kids were saying they were still using this all the way through college. And that's what this is about. Because it's based on research into how the brain learns things, it never it never ages out. Even adults in the workplace can use a lot of these techniques and strategies and structures if they if they knew what they were. So the idea is to prepare kids for the long term, both in long term memory retention and in the long term use of these kinds of structures. Everything is based on research into how the brain learns things. Um, this started in the late nineties. Harvard University, which, as you know, has a lot of their own scientists involved in a lot of research around the world, decided that so much information was starting to come out about the brain that they decided to take all of this information and do something with it. And they started the Learning in the Brain conferences uh, at Harvard and invited people involved in education to come up and learn what was coming out as it related to learning. Um, they had other conferences for people in the medical fields and different fields where they did this research apply. But uh, when I was at Green Hill, it was mandated that you go to conferences every year. And I had been to just about every science one on planet Earth by then. And so I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll go. And it really did change me and a lot of ways, both as a teacher, but also as a parent. And I brought those things back to my classroom. There were a lot of things I was doing in the classroom that I knew worked, but I didn't particularly know why they worked. And the research clarified that. And over the course of time, as this program developed, the research has done nothing but validate it, validate it, and validate it. It just keeps validating over and over that this, that this works and that it's good for kids, and it's also good for anybody else that wants to use it. So that's where we are with it. And we're going to talk about the components that you will be um, involved with as parents of, the, of uh, students here in the Kiva. Um, the main thing is that what scientists know about how the brain learns as it applies to education. It can be boiled down into three main components, and these are the these are the things that we're going to be focusing on in the classroom as the kids and the teachers learn this program and implement it. The first thing is put things into the brain in small packages. The biggest mistake that most kids and teachers that that don't realize it is they're trying to input too much information in too short a period of time. Because historically for kids, and think back to your own school times, you would collect your notes, collect your notes, collect your notes, teacher would announce a test, and boom, you would start studying. And you had this compressed amount of time to do it, and maybe you remembered enough stuff to do well on the test but you were not putting things into long-term memory. And one of the things I tell 
with my students that I work with is if you don't come out of the test on the other side and can remember all of this information and these concepts that you were working on, then you really did not educate yourself. You did not become a more knowledgeable person. Yes, you passed a test and the adults in your life are happy, but if you don't combine that with retention on the other side, what was all of that energy used for? Not much. So the idea is to put things in in small packages combined with some other steps, and then it becomes permanent knowledge that you can build a foundation on going forward. So the first thing that we'll concentrate on is how do you reduce packages of information and concepts into manageable pieces? So that's the first thing that the teachers and the kids are going to be working on. The second one is, and this is actually the newest research and the strongest research, is that the more you make connections for your brain with something that it already knows and understands, the faster things go into long-term memory and are, and are retained. Connections can be all sorts of things, and the kids will be learning some of these, we call them study tricks and things like that, and they'll be learning those techniques throughout uh, the school year. But that's an important and vital key. Research shows over and over and over the brain does not like random. It doesn't like randomness. It doesn't like lists of words. It doesn't like lists of facts. It will, on its own, be searching for connections that it understands. And so if you give it those connections and make it work less hard for them, then the learning happens faster and for a longer period of time. The third thing is, you do it over and over again. That only makes sense. It's how kids learn to ride bicycles. It's why you have soccer practice and football practice and piano practice and all of those things. Because the brain has got to put together a system of memories and connections. And it's why if a child learns to ride a bicycle and you put that bicycle away for 10 years even, as soon as they get back on the bicycle, they know how to ride it again. They're not having to reteach themselves. Because of the over and overness of learning it, it is an ingrained and deeply held memory that is automatic for the brain. So we apply the same thing to learning, and those are strategies that the kids will be working on as well. So these are the three things. It's just three simple things. Smaller packages, make connections, do it over and over again. And everything you see your kids do will fit one of these categories. Okay? Let me go back on. One of the things that we need to do, let me go back to. Okay. I'm going to back this up just a second. All right, take you. Can I ask a question or what are you doing? Uh, at the end, it's great, but if you have one that applies now, that's okay too. Yes? One fundamental question. Who's your, who's your customer? Is it the teacher or the student? Are you teaching the teachers to communicate? I'm teaching the teachers. The teachers are going to be teaching your kids. However, I am going to meet with your children directly and try to teach them the brain research so that they understand why the teachers are going to be asking them to do things the way that they're going to do it. It's going to be a closed circle by the time we're through. Now, this is the first thing I'm going to teach your kids is um, to keep their hippo happy. So this is what we're going to focus on. I'm going to give them a little bit of research into the parts of the brain that are affected the most by what they do. And those two things are the hippocampus and the amygdala. The hippocampus is the master organizer for the brain. All of the sensory messages that the brain picks up move through the hippocampus, and the hippocampus decides where to send those for um, interpretation. 
So, when things come into the hippocampus, I'm going to show them that there's sections of the brain and there's parts of the brain. The sections of the brain involved in learning and memory are all here in the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe deals with movement and physicality. The occipital lobe is vision. And there's two temporal lobes that deal with auditory processing. Very deep in the middle, and you can kind of see the relationship to the frontal lobe, is the hippocampus here and the amygdala there. The hippocampus is the, the part that we try to keep happy with small packages. When we deliver this, these messages in small packages, the hippocampus can better decide where to put these things where they can be retrieved quicker. If we overload that hippocampus, it just sort of scatters. And the illustration that I make with the teachers and the kids is this. Think back to your own days in school, and was there a time when you read a test question and you went, oh yeah, man, I know this. I studied this. I know I saw this. And it's not there for you when you need it. And then an hour later, you're sitting in your next class or the cafeteria, and then there comes the answer that you were looking for an hour ago. That's happened to all of us. And the reason it happened is every message that the brain gets goes somewhere. But if we don't form the connection we need for retrieval, we're asking the brain to look through all the files until it finds it. And that may or may not be when we need it. And that's what happens to you when you don't make the hippo happen. So Hopefully, at some point, you'll hear your kids coming home and using the term, I've got to keep my hippo happy, because that's what the small packages is about, so that it knows where it's putting it, and we're going to build a direct connection for retrieval. And when they see a key word from then on, they'll instantly know what it is they need to, to respond with. That's the goal. So keeping the hippo happy also affects the amygdala. So the amygdala is your emotion control. And the amygdala is what creates test stress and anxiety in kids when they lack confidence in what they're doing. And it could be school, it could be a task, it could be a sport, but the amygdala goes into overdrive when kids don't have the confidence that they know how to do this. And so if we keep the hippo happy, we keep the amygdala under control. And when kids come into a classroom for a test, they come in with confidence because they know they know it. They know it's going to come because they've done all of the steps necessary to make that happen. That is our goal. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's what we're working for this school year is to Keep the hippo happy and keep the amygdala under control. Tamp down, not real stressed out. So these are the components of the program. White noise, notes, and there's a specific way to take notes uh, that's brain friendly. Study calendars and daily planners, which is what the school is working on right now with the kids. Highlighting and color coding, graphic organizers, vendors, RDR, and study clues, which also become connections that we're trying to make. So I'm just going to blitz you through these components. And if you picked up a handout, there's places on there for you to make notes. And the main steps of the program are uh, illustrated for you. There's even a parent's checklist that you can use as the year goes on to monitor if your kids are grasping and utilizing each of these steps as they learn. <clears throat> First of all, it's white noise. What you're looking at here is a thermal scan of the brain. And when thermal scans were created, a whole new world of science opened up, including brain science. For decades, Scientists have estimated parts of the brain that do certain things or control certain tasks or certain activities. 
But when we got thermal imaging, we were able to really key in on specific areas that are affected by specific tests. What you're looking at here is somebody that's listening to music. So if you have a kid who, and a lot of our high school kids try to put this one on us, I do better if I have my music. I can study better with my music. It's baloney, and research says it's baloney, and this shows that it's baloney. Because what happens is, in a thermal scan, the areas that are red are the areas that need more blood at that particular time for that particular activity. And it can happen anywhere in the body. If you eat, your stomach's going to show redder than other parts of your body. The blue does not mean that there's no activity. It just doesn't need as much blood as these areas that are red. And what you see here is a lot of stuff going on in the frontal lobe and lots going on here in the temporal lobe, a little bit going here with the eyes. Now this is movement. These sections are movement. This is the section you want red at all times because that's what's keeping your heartbeat going and your breathing going. If this thing goes blue, you're dead. So this part will always be red, hopefully. This part has to do with movement. So this person is probably listening to music and maybe tapping their foot or, you know, wiggling around or something to do with it. When you're trying to study or you're trying to concentrate, those are not the areas that you want lit up. Music is the single most complicated thing that brains deal with. Because if you think about what's going on in music for the brain to analyze, there's beat, rhythm, melody, tune, words, all sorts of stuff. And the brain's constantly having to figure out all this stuff and when one song ends and another one begins, it starts all over with that. So kids that listen to their music when they are studying, the brain is busy with the music. It is not busy with what's in front of them. They can say that and they can think that, but it's not happening. They did a study in a major university that, that clarified this. And what they did was they divided kids in a freshman class into three groups. One group, they all had the same grades, it's all the same class. There were about 2,000 kids in the class. So it's probably, I always like to say it's Ohio State because they said Midwestern. Anyway, <coughs> the story I tell my kids is they did a study because students wanted a rule in the dorm that from 7 to midnight on school nights, the dorms had to be quiet. And the university basically said, we can't do that. It's impossible. Just go to the library. Well, in this school, whatever it is, the library was all the way across campus, and you had to cross the highway to get there. So it wasn't convenient for these kids, and they wanted a little change. So they went to the psychology department, and they worked up a study that the university said they would look at. So they took a freshman class, subdivided, pulled out the B students, the average, subdivided them into three groups, gave them the same information, the same amount of time to study, and then put them in three different environments to do it. And one was in the dorm, regular room, just like always. One group was given a quiet room in their dorm to study in. And the third group had to stay in their room, but they closed the door and they put a fan on their desk. And when the test results came back, the hypothesis had been kids in the quiet room will do better, kids in the regular dorm room will do worse. And that's not what happened. The kids with the fan made the highest grades, kids in the regular dorm room lowest, kids in the quiet room in the, in the middle. And they couldn't figure it out until they looked at the scans they did during the study. And what they found was kids in the regular dorm room 
their brains pretty much look like this most of the time because there's, you know, it going. There's stuff going on all the time, and the brain's constantly having to figure it out and analyze it. But why did the kids in the quiet room not do as well? When they looked at the scans, what they discovered was that this was being red and this was blue. That's what they thought they'd see. But then they noticed this would switch to blue and this would switch to red. And it would go back and forth in various intervals. And they finally figured out there is no such thing as a quiet room. So if that's what your environment for your child is at home, it's not the most conducive for them. Because in our world, there's all kinds of these little random sounds in our house. A door closes, a toilet flushes, a dog barks, a chair scrape. Even in a library, people are coughing, they're moving their chairs, they're closing their books, they're ruffling pages. So what the brain does is every time it hears one of those little noises, its job is to check it out, which it does, and then it realizes oh, there's nothing much going on here. But when you come back, you got to kind of start over again. So you're constantly restarting your studying, and you're not really moving forward a whole lot. But with white noise, the brain checks it out the first time it hears it, and what it realizes is. There's nothing going on here. There's no words, there's no rhythm, there's no melody. It's just the same sound all the time. And the temporal lobe will light up first, but then the, the frontal lobe becomes red and it stays red, which means learning, memory, and retention is taking place. So, you want to put your child in a study environment with white noise. The best use of white noise is an app on the phone called White Noise. And the fact that it's even available tells us that brain research has made it into the mainstream. Because there's seven or eight variations of color noise on there that are just different pitches of white noise. So what I have my students do is I have them download that, put in their earbuds, and pick the color that they like, the sound that they like. And they'll say, oh, it bothers me. But then they'll be like, oh, I didn't even notice that after a while. They'll notice it at first. And even kids that have sensory issues will get on board with this because the brain is still going to ignore that sound after a while. It's not going to stay focused on it. So that's the first change I would make in your child's environment at home. Yes, just point it, not use it. No. I think that's important. Use it's the worst. The worst. I had a question. And just a question. Like, aren't we creating like a master? Just for example, I'm a friend. I've been living here for 14 years. My kids go to sleep in a dark room and the door is closed and the noise machine and the blanket and the this and the that. My niece and my nephew will fall asleep in the corner and the middle of the wedding and the middle of the party on the first floor. The teacher one is laughing at me. And I'm like, you can laugh, but people are sleeping well and I enjoy it. But aren't we creating like, kids cannot study in like a house and someone shut the door or flush the toilet. It's not like extreme. Like, there will always be able to. Isolate yourself, but you know, like I'm just asking. Yeah, I, I totally understand your point. And there's a certain amount of if you talk sleep versus concentration, there's a difference in what you're trying to achieve with the brain. In concentration, you're dealing with information and facts, and they have to be placed somewhere. Sleep is not like that. Sleep is that brain shutting down and taking a rest, and it's different. That like, wasn't my point. My point is like the kid, we get to use like sleep. Like, so so are you creating a false reality, reality like, for them? The phone thing. goes away now, we can't study it. Right. Well, then that's why you use a fan, or there's other things. What I did in my classroom is on a regular day, we would have nothing going 
going on. But when I really wanted the kids to concentrate or be able to concentrate, I had a big floor fan. And it wasn't coming directly into their ears, but it did mask those smaller sounds. And that's why the kids in the study that had the fan on their desk did better. Because not only did it cover the sounds in the background of the door, it also hid all those little random sounds that the brain is always jumping out to. So we can say it's a false equivalency, except when kids study, we're already placing them into an environment that's not a usual environment anyway. We're looking for a place where they can concentrate. So all we're doing is setting up and making that a more productive place than the library or their room or the kitchen table. And just another point that you said that it's mm -hmm. an app. I just imagine myself as a kid, as a student, I would never like battle with the cell phone next to me. Mm -hmm. I said daily like battle with my kids. I don't know what machine did you have. Yeah. No, I'm just saying like what's your no what's your what's your like thought about like the cell phone next to them when they stand. Well, I prefer the cell if you're using the cell phone app. And remember, there needs to be a phone. It could be an iPad. It could be a fan. It could be a lot of things that make white noise. My son, even before they came out with white noise machines, which is your first indication that this was hitting the commercial venue, he would sometimes uh, go and use a hair dryer <laughs> and sit on cool. You know, just because he he realized that he just focused better, and he was not a focus was never an issue for him. But he noticed he concentrated better if he didn't listen to what was going on in the house. So the phones make it easy because you just plug in those little earbuds and put it on airplane. No, I think she's yeah. saying, what do you think about a copy of the phone near you when you're yeah. oh, oh, distracted? Not a doctor. My, my, what my, uh, a lot of my moms and dads do is they turn it face down, or they use an iPod, which doesn't have the um, the texting and all that, the features, and thank good, thank you, that's a word I'm searching for, that a phone does. But at some point, the kids, I hope, will realize this is actually helping and they're not going to be tempted to do the other. Now, I know when I worked with Xander and we did it, the text message came through, his little eyes would kind of, you know, he'd want to look over there. So you can make those choices in your own home's environment. But what I'm saying is, the more you can introduce white noise into their study environment, the more productive their time will be in that environment. Yes. The rules change for middle school versus high school. No, they even get in high school. It's even more important because the packages in high school are way bigger. And one of the things I do when I work with high school kids is they buy into my program because I tell them if they use it, they actually have time for a social life because that's what high school cares about. Middle school. They want to keep you happy. They want you off their backs as much as possible. High school, it's all about I've got to have time for my peeps. You know, so, to do these things. So are they being taught this at school? Are they hearing about white noise from the teachers? They're going to be. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like we're we just them. started with this. We're working our so way. So when we say it to the kids, they're not going to be like, "What do you do?" After the 16th, they'll know what that is. So well, you can just. Uh, yeah, and just no, it's just in 6th, 7th, and 8th here okay. right now. And my other question is, is you're saying the white noise for studying. So when they're taking concentrating, whether it's studying or studying. What happens when they go to take the test? And now the doors opening and other people are walking in and out. Like you, can't always, uh, you can't always work on that environment, but they don't need that concentration when it's now. All, of, all of the other steps have created the links to the to the memory cells that we want. We can have one thing. I'm going to give, I can give your email address if that's okay with mm -hmm. you, Karen. But a lot of people have to meet. It's right. seven. So okay. We're only on number one. White noise at work. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do it or don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What we're working on right now is a study calendar and a daily planner for your kids. Um, it looks like this. 
the teachers are going to be asking the students to highlight their subjects by color. Uh, you don't need to know a lot about what all that means. It's, it's part of the program. Color coding is a big deal. And so if your kids have not already done that, they're going to be assigned to color code by subject their entire planet. So you're going to be seeing that coming home very soon, if, if not in the next couple of days. For your benefit, you're going to also see assignments written down all the way across the board. Teachers are going to put these assignments on their board. Kids are going to write them down as soon as they come in the classroom. And when you look across this page, you should see bullets separating assignments if there's more than one in that class. If there is no assignment in that class, you should see NHW, which means no homework, in that square. You should not be seeing blank squares. We're going to be teaching the kids that a blank is an automatic brain safety net that tells them they've forgotten something. They didn't do what they were supposed to. They didn't write it down like they were supposed to. And we want to wean them off of always using a homework portal to get their information. They need to be getting it firsthand in the classroom so that when there's a question, there's a teacher there to answer it before it comes to you. So the teachers are going to be working on that. You as a parent should be seeing your students check these off as they finish the assignment. So we're using this like their checklist. What do I need to do tonight? Read straight across. Once I do it, check it off, check it off, check it off. Should never be an issue with having homework ready to turn in. Okay? So this is happening very soon. Hopefully tomorrow the next day. Because this is what we talked about in our teacher meeting today. So for your information, you should have a child coming home to highlight their book all the way through. And you should be seeing bullets and assignments in every box, okay? The students have binders, one for genetic studies, one for um, their academic classes. They are color-coded by subject. The front pocket is for paper. The idea behind this is for kids to handle materials as little as possible. The less they have to keep up with, the less they have to lose. Maybe you're blessed with a beautifully organized child, but many of us are not. And so this is going to help those kids have a structure to function in. The first is paper. All they have to do is pull out a piece. No clicking rings, no torn holes, nothing. Each class has a divider. The front pocket is where you will see homework. Only the front pocket. It will come out of the front pocket, goes back in the front pocket when it's done. Once we get to vendor cards, which we'll, you'll hear about much later, those will be in a packet like this, and those go there, and this is what they study from. Okay? Small packages. We're going to take all those notes, all those facts, we're going to put them on one half of a three by five card. And Xander was just in Ari's office today asking me, when are we doing vendors? Because he knows these little things work and he's ready to do them. I said, not yet. Also, all the notes for the year are going to fit in that. At some, at some point, not the vendors. I'm saying, like, when they take notes in class, it's going to go in that spiral. Each teacher is going to have a different setup. Some will just use the back pocket to store notes if they don't have a lot. Other teachers may have spirals. The kids will know what each teacher, and the spirals will be kept. This is the beauty of this notebook here in the front pockets. We're still not using the rings. The things that go in the rings are things that teachers want kids referring to over and over and over again during the year, and they'll be in sheet protectors in the rings for reference. Okay? The idea is if the kid has homework, they flip to their divider, they pull it out, they do it, it goes right back in the same place. 
stuff they need to work with is in the back pocket or in their spiral or in the folder, whatever the teacher wants them working with, and that's stored in the front. Okay? So they have a set of highlighters. And we're color coding everything. The teachers have chosen the colors. This is what the, the standard book will be color coded with. Uh, there'll be other things. The vendor cards will be color coded with these. There'll be a whole lot of color coding going on as kids learn why we color code. Okay? Okay. They're going to keep a study calendar and a planner. The planner is day by day, week by week. And at the end of each week, it will flip to a new week, and they'll move their little tabs week by week by week. So that all they have to do is tab open to where they need to write their assignments. They have a clip that gets them to their study calendars in the front of the book. The only thing that goes on study calendars are test dates and project due dates and project target dates, which they're going to be taught as well. There's no more telling you the night before a project is due that you've got to run to Tom's Thumb and get some poster board. The idea is we will set target dates for the kids to shoot for. If they hit those targets, they'll have two to three nights of being done with it. They can turn it in early, they can upgrade it, whatever. If they miss their target, they're at least close, and they built a two to three night safety net for themselves to finish it up or to make it better. But no more last minute stuff. They're gonna be taught all of the steps that you do to hit a target and have everything ready the best it can be on the due date. So that's why you're gonna see two different Two different time management tools being used. And the study calendar will be color coded by the subject, and targets will be marked as circles. If you'll notice, this is when this is due, back up three nights. Here's when we tell the brain that it's due, and this is what we work for. And the kids will be taught the actual steps that you take to have that happen and, and achieve it because there's a definite system that goes along with that. Color coding and highlighting. This is how we make small packages. If you've got younger kids, you can already start them on this with spelling lists, for example. When you ask kids to learn an entire list of something, the package is too big for them, for the hippocampus. It's not happy with that. So what we do is, this is an example of how you take a big list and reduce it to a smaller package. This is a sample that, I've, that several schools use. They give kids spelling words on Monday night to take a test on Friday morning. So you divide your list by the number of nights you have to study it minus one. So if they have until Friday, they have three nights, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then they have Thursday. So on Monday, they only study those four words and they don't even look at the others. So they can learn four words in a night versus 10 or 20. My school used to give them 20. So this next night, they, they learn the next ones and they look back at these once. once I, the third night, they only look at these. They look back at these once. On Thursday night before the test, they take a practice test. You give them a practice test. And Thursday night, they only work on the words they missed. And you'll be surprised at how few of those there are. So these are some more examples of how we use color code. <laughs> this is from an, everything I'm going to show you comes straight out of my class, a classroom that I've worked with. The kids had to learn all the presidents of the United States, and there's a whole other sheet that the rest of them have to write. They had to learn the whole list of 40 plus in order. So we divided the list, we color coded it, 
and we follow that same strategy, just these words, these words, these words. In addition, we added a mnemonic to learn each of those lists, and mnemonics come later, but it's a, that's the connecting part. So we, have, we put three, all three of those components to work, small packages, make connections, that's the mnemonics, do it over and over again, one time each of those nights. So here's the color coding used that way. Here it is. This is out of my classroom with fourth graders. And this is how you do an illustration. They had to learn 27 bones by their scientific names. And they had two weeks to do it. And so they had their Monday words, their Tuesday, their Wednesday, their Thursday, their Friday. It's color coded. On Monday, they only look at the bones in the head and nothing else, just those. On Tuesday, just the bones of the chest and so forth. They're color coded. And you'll notice that there are common names next to them. Because when I gave this test to fourth graders, I gave them a blank skeleton, nothing else. No dots, no lines, nothing. And they had to put the dot, they had to draw the line, and they had to put the skeleton's name, the bone's name. So by learning the common name with it, they learned automatically where to put the dot. Put it on the foot, put it on the cheek, put it on the breastbone, and so forth. And all up and down here are little clues and mnemonics that help them put those in the right place at the right time. So that's another way to use your color code. This is a way, I understand y'all have a class that does map studies. Well, maps are one of the very most difficult things for the brain to handle because there's no continuity to the shapes or the design of these countries. And half of them change their name every really year to do. So what you do if you're helping your child learn a map is take whatever it is they need to learn and subdivide it again by the number of nights they have to learn. And try to have each section of the map have approximately the same number of pieces. Okay? Now, I would actually redo this map because these are bigger pieces, but there's not as many. And I didn't realize how many tiny countries there are up here. So this line would now be moved over. And there's a few more pieces here. When you're ready to start learning those countries, you start at 12 o'clock. And you always learn in clockwise order around that section. At the same time you do that, you throw in the new model. So for example, this section is Libya, Egypt, Eritrea, and so forth. Libya and Eritrea to even sudden chagrin. So we do a clockwise small package connections, new models. Okay? So the kids will be learning that in their classrooms with their teachers. So you will be seeing some of that. So my daughter's been working on math, she's not as healthy for her mother, gets really mm -hmm. hungry. So one of the things I know is that when she's learning on a flat piece of paper uh -huh. and memorizing that paper, it's totally different than when you, you have to bring a globe right in front of the piece. Mm -hmm. So you look at the memorizing the paper and you look at the Pacific here and Pacific here, it's not flat, the world is round, so mm -hmm. we have to really be learning it from the globe. And then, but she's going to be tested on the flat. Yeah, on the flat. Mm -hmm. So that's how she has to be studied. Now, it's beautiful to connect the flap to the globe because that finishes the connections that you're trying to make. But for testing, she's not going to be given a globe usually. She's going to be given a flat paper. So this is a system that works on the flat paper. And then you can ask her to transfer that to the globe and show you that she understands what it is she's learned. So the next thing the teachers will be working on with me is highlighting. Because highlighting is how we bring the packages into smaller pieces. We take the highlighter and we highlight keywords only. There's a sample in your package 
I don't know if the highlighting came through, but um, that's the first thing that the kids will be taught how to do. There is an art to highlight. And if you're like I was, well, none of you are like I was, because I was in school before highlighters were even invented. <laughs> and we used pencils and shapes and things to kind of do the same thing. But the, the key with highlighting is kids need to find out if they're over highlighters or they're under highlighters. Because if you're an over highlighter, you're going to spend a lot of time studying stuff that turns out not to be so important. If you're an under highlighter, you don't have to study enough stuff. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to give the kids a little highlighting activity that helps them figure out what they are. And then they're going to find out what words are usually key words. I'll give you the answer. It's nouns, verbs, and adjectives, mostly. Once they're past second grade, the brain can put in conjunctions and prepositions and all, what, all those things we call support words that make sentences. We don't need to study that. Raise your hand if you used to highlight whole sentences in your textbooks in school. Thank you, Corey, right, for being brave enough to admit it. So what you did basically was you changed the black and white to yellow and black. You did not significantly shrink the package, and you did not really pull out what was truly important. So the kids are going to learn how to highlight correctly. And you're going to see highlighters used for it from now on once the teachers have that lesson. It's next month, and then already later this month is that lesson. Here's the deal on textbooks. A lot of high schools make the kids buy the textbooks, just like they do in college. Green Hill and Parrish both did that. And so kids could do that right in the, right in the textbooks. Many schools are going to ebooks. So I tell my students, just go ahead and print off that chapter and highlight it. Just because the physical act of doing, moving that highlighter versus uh, holding a key down and highlighting, there's worlds of difference between what the brain connects by physically moving your muscle versus a, a fingertip. So you still want kids holding the highlighter in their hands and actually highlighting physically. Despite the fact that the books are so freaking heavy, like these kids I know. And the, the, their back way more than we do. Honey, you're preaching to the choir here. That alone, I think, is overwhelming. Yes. To carry a bag and and just look and think. Like, One of the things I suggest to my schools is if you want kids to use those real books, and there are still schools that want those. They don't want the e-books. They want the real paper books. Then what they need to do is buy one extra classroom set and keep it in the classroom and send them home with a book that stays at home and it's not being lugged back and forth in a backpack with three other books that weigh 50 pounds and your notebooks and everything else and that way if they need their book in class there's a set there if they need it at home there's a book there and they can make copies by chapters or something huh I don't know how much that is, but why, why, why not just print the chapter? Like when you're working on that chapter, that's what the school Some schools do that as well. Some teachers do that as well. Because not very many teachers use every chapter and every page in a textbook. And some teachers right. just pull them out. So it's totally a classroom issue, but there are ways to make it work with this system. And if you're using a book, then high, then print off the chapter for the kids and still let them physically do the highlighting. So how, how, are, how are they going to do that here? Huh? How are they going to do that here? I, I, have just, I, I bought a, uh, like the, the eighth grade algebra book. Mm -hmm. I bought used on Amazon for a dollar. I know, for a couple of And days. so, yeah, so yeah, we've like, got it at home and now. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's wow. cheap. I mean, all of them. Nice. Well, you have two of your administrators here in this room. I'm sure at some point we will. 
One advantage yes. of having 10 year old textbooks is that you can buy used ones online. <laughs> <laughs> You see, that's, that is actually the impetus for most schools yeah. to change is because these textbooks change every other year. And they make an investment in them, and then it's a waste of investment. But those are issues that the school can address as this program takes takes uh, takes place, because those are valid issues to discuss. I think that the science book is online. I'm pretty sure, like I remember Xander studying the science book online last year. They got a new science year last year. Yeah, they got a new science book. And in that case, if she's assigned him a chapter to read, you can just make him a copy of it and let him, yeah. let him highlight it off. Okay? All right, then the next step is we take it, it's in your packet, you take the highlighted pieces of information and you put them in graphic organizer form. The brain needs to understand how facts are related to each other. They need to understand that this, I've highlighted all these words, but if you just leave them there, they're still just a random list. The brain needs to understand how they fit together. One of the things you don't want to do is have your kids study off of a highlighted piece of paper. Because the highlighting has told the brain, these are the important words, pay attention to them. But the brain is too sophisticated for that, and it's still going to try to read all the black that it still sees on that page. So they are accomplishing nothing if they don't move the, the yellow words off the page and do something with them. So in classes that are fact heavy, like your histories and your sciences, for example, you always want to use a graphic organizer that the child's brain tells that child, well, I think these go together, and I think these go together, and these go together. And you can have 16 kids in a room, and you can have 16 different looking graphic organizers because each kid's brain may connect things differently, and that's okay. There's not a right or a wrong to anybody's graphic organizer. It's how their brain sees the connections. So we want our kids doing that as an in-between step from gaining the information and putting it on the vendor cards for actually storing. Okay? If it's vocabulary words or definitions or foreign language words, they don't need to do graphic organizers. They just need to reduce the definitions and vocabulary down into smaller packages when they make their vendor cards. That This step can be skipped for that. But when you're reading about battles and people and events and science concepts, the brain needs to understand their connections to each other. And so the graphic organizer becomes a really important step. Now, then we move to the vendor cards. These are going to be a huge component of the program. And my kids that I've taught over the years, for example, Daniel's friend that she was talking about, it's these vendor cards more than anything else that the kids carry with them into college. I used my son at Green Hill as my guinea pig for all of this stuff that I'm working out here with you guys. Lucky man. Some things <laughs> went by the wayside, and other things became really strong components of the program based on him. And we had many pitched battles over, why are you making me do this? I hate it. You know, just typical teenage pushback. And I never felt appreciated for this wonderful gift that I was giving him until he was in law school. And he came home his first semester of law school. And he said, Mom, I don't know how my friends are going to make it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they just keep reading stuff over and over and over. He said, I'm sitting there, I'm comparing this brief to this one and this case to this one, and I'm drawing this and I'm making vendor cards. And I just don't know how they're going to do it. And he didn't say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least I could tell from what he said that A, because he realized it worked, and B, he knew where it came from. 
He knew exactly where he got it from. So this is this is law school. This is even after college. So this is the gift that they can take with them. But the vendor card looks like this. If you look up here, this is your typical flash card. Word on one side, meaning on the other. This is a vendor card. Now you look at that and tell me which one you think your brain could learn. So those two are wrong. That's the typical way people normally make yeah, the, the bottom one is the way that Lisa's suggesting is a is better way to make. There's fun. so much wrong with this one. First of all, and the main thing is, is when you have a word on one side and the meaning on the other, how do you check yourself to see if it's right? What do you do? You flip it. So where did the brain ever see the two things together? Never. So every time a child flips a, a flashcard, whether it's math facts in second grade or facts in a history class, they are breaking a connection that the brain is desperately trying to make for them. So that's the first thing that's wrong with these cards. The second thing is it's in cursive writing. What did your kids grow up reading? Manuscript, print. It's not until they got in eight or nine years old that we stuck them with cursive. And you're trying to undo eight years of learning that the brain has been working on by throwing in cursive. And for kids with core motor skills, you've added another layer of difficulty to their study. This becomes a labor to make these cards. And we want it quick. We want it quick and we want it to be used properly. So we print everything that needs to be learned. And you will notice we have picked out the key nouns, verbs, and adjectives that were in this definition. There's nothing in that bottom card that's not included in that top card. And if you ask a child to give you the definition of an adjective, and they learn these words, can they put in all of these other little helper words and write a sentence? Yes, they can. So why study all those unnecessary support words? Why not study just the key words? Okay? So this is how a vendor card works. You would have, and I used one of the Neville Hershey cards um, terms out of your packet there just to show you. Um, if you look at the Milton Hershey graphic organizer and find the square for childhood, you can see how it gets moved. Look at the graphic organizer and find that childhood square. Should be the second one. I think. That graphic organizer, I think it's on the back of, no, that's your vendor one. The graphic organizer is what I want y'all to look at. No. Look at this one and find the childhood section. So what we do is we highlight and milk and curse you down. Then this is actually a child's graphic organizer. I just made it pretty for this handout. But the child that made it, it was just scribbled on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be pretty. So she took all the words that she highlighted that had to do with childhood and she grouped them together. Another child might have grouped them differently, but this is how this child is. Then we take the name of the box, childhood, and we take the highlighted words that were put in that box, and it automatically is now your study card. And what the child will do to study is, they use it the same way they've always used a flashcard. You look at the word, you say, this is important, out loud what you think is on the other side. And then you open it to check yourself, and what does the brain see? It's constantly reinforcing the connection instead of breaking it by flipping. If you're drilling your kids on flashcards and things, 
They don't have to do it in this exact order. I just have kids talk me through it. Okay, tell me about his childhood. Well, he was an apprentice printer, and he didn't read very well, and his childhood was difficult. It doesn't matter as long as all of these bullets are covered in what that child says. It does not have to be in this order exactly. And I like them to talk me through it rather than go, the first bullet is childhood. No, no, it was the first bullet's difficult. The second bullet, they don't have to do it that way. Just talk it through because that's how the brain is going to deliver the answer to them is the way they talk it through. And all we're doing here is getting at the words to use. They will do this exercise when you see that first little packet of cards come home that I showed you in a subject. They are to do this one time, but they do it every single night. And it's going to look in the assignment book, it's going to be called RDR, Regular Daily Review. And it should be an assignment every single day until they take their test once they make these cards. So that's something else you can look for, is that RDR code. And we call them vendor cards. I used to tell my fourth graders, I invented vendor cards. They are like so impressed. And then I'm like, you want to know how I did it? And I, think, I go, to the card. <laughs> Now you can do four by six if you've got a child that's dysgraphic or has trouble writing, big cards are fine. This, the premise is going to be the same. You should see a bullet next to each key fact or phrase. You should see a space between each bullet because that way the brain reads this as one package, one package, one package. Two words, one word, three words, not 20 words. If there's not enough room on their vendor card to leave those spaces, they just go on to another card and name it the same name. The number of cards is not important. And this is the hardest thing for me to get through to my kids. They just don't want to be stuck with cards, so they cram everything on here. And I tell them, when you don't make the cards correctly, you're back to square one doing it the hard way. You will learn the correctly made cards, even if there's two of them here, faster than you will one that's made incorrectly. Because once again, if you take the spaces out to squish it in, now you've got too big a package. So you're defeating the whole purpose of the exercise. <clears throat> now these are just some of the formats. The top one is how a definition card would look. We didn't have to do a graphic organizer for that. This is how a vocabulary card would look. This is how a word, a card would look where we did a graphic organizer and we pulled out the main facts and placed them on the card. <clears throat> you encourage pictures on? Yeah, you can do pictures. In fact, that's what graphic organizing is, it's pictures. I love to have kids draw pictures of what they understand because the brain is really, really visual. It loves pictures, it loves shapes, colors. The more kids can draw what they understand, the better. And that's the whole premise behind the graphic organizer. Even. Study clues of what the kids are gonna learn later in the year, but it's these little memory tricks and they're going to highlight the things that connect each side of the card together. In the word of starting, for example, you have an S and a C, and it means steep clip, S and C. We highlight those together. When the card is folded and they see the S and the C, boom, steep clip. Just, it's going to come like that. And the more they use their study clues and their tricks, the faster that will come. So they're going to be doing a lot of this, but they'll do more of this after the first of the year. We want the rest of these steps to be much more ingrained before we move to a higher level of uh, implementation. These are more examples 
of the kinds of mnemonics your kids are going to be learning. These are called acrostic mnemonics. My very eager marine just saw her to the Nephews. That's the planets. All of us had something like this on them when we were little. What I do is I teach the kids to use at least the first two letters of what they're trying to connect the real world to. And the more of the real world they use, the faster that goes into long-term memory for the brain. But these are what are the, these these are vendor cards. The mnemonic always goes on the left because it's the mnemonic that they're actually going to work, and it's going to give them the other answer. This is a random list of words. This is a sentence with a subject and a verb. Brain loves subject and verbs. Doesn't like random lists. So this will be coming home a lot after the first of the year. Yes. Do you have um, these slides? I do. Oh, sure. If y'all are interested in a set of the slides, I can totally give a key a, a, a set of originals for you. No okay. problem at all. So they are licensed to use this program, and anything I'm sharing with them is y'all's. So if you like that, then we can make sure you get a set of it. But you, they're going to do that later on. So well, if you them in classes and other books, you can come later after the. If class. you're working with them and you can think of a, a, a neat way to remember something, go ahead and introduce them to them. But it'll come in the classroom after the turn of the year. We want to give the implementation steps time. For the teachers to use them and for the kids to be in a very strong routine of using them. So that's why we're going to do it this way. Now, this is an example of a child coming up with his own mnemonics. Remember that skeleton picture I showed you? These are his. I, get, I used to give my kids extra credit if they showed me that they were using their mnemonics because I wanted them to prove to me that they were using the program. Not that their grades didn't tell me that. But if they showed me the mnemonic that they came up with, they got a point for each one. So here's his Monday words. Creatives do mammals meet creatively. And that's for cranium, zygomatic, etc. Hungry rabbits under cars meet belief. And here's the bones. So instead of trying to put these scientific words into memory over and over and over again, he simply learned hungry rabbits and he knew what bone that was there. So the mnemonics are hugely important for learning what's on the cards. And what we want to get our kids to over a period of time and practice is where they can come up with some kind of trick for each card. If they can't, then they're just going to have to memorize that card. But even that's going to be easier because the package is way smaller and they've tried to make connections whenever possible. It's going to reduce significantly what they just have to memorize. One thing that's come out of the research as to how it relates to learning is just memorizing is the poorest form of study, the very lowest form of study. So anything we can do to take them up out of that, that's what we want to do. It'll be harder for the sixth graders at first, but I'm going to be teaching the teachers some tricks I used when I taught it to my kids. The eighth graders hopefully will do a better job. My high school kids are the ones that love mnemonics because they have been tested long enough that they get the value of it and many times they have come up with their own ideas for a mnemonic they just didn't know that's what it was they just know it made it easier to learn so they love the mnemonics and our goal is to send them out of the kiva to whatever school you go to and they can take this with them Whichever high school your kids end up going to won't matter. They'll be equipped to handle that. RDR, 
I want I I skipped that. Let me go to the previous slide here. Hang on a second. Okay. Why didn't they go back, Ari? Just use the arrows on the keyboard. Just use the keyboard yeah. arrows? Yeah. All right. This is typically the system that kids employ in study that I referenced earlier. Collect your notes, collect, 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 stuff them in the book, stuff them in your notebook, whatever. Test is announced, and this is one class, and this is a minimum of 30 minutes I'm trying to study. And oh gosh, it's the end of the marking period, so now I've got this class of the test and this class of the test. So at the minimum, you're talking an hour and a half, two hours of the constant read, 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 study. They may do well enough on a test to make a decent grade, but ask them the same thing three weeks later and see what you get from them. It won't be near as clear. But this is what RDR is going to be. <laughs> the very day that kids get their information, from their teacher, however it's given, in a book, in a handout, notes in class, they're going to highlight them down. If they need to graphically organize, they'll spend two seconds doing that, and they'll make their vendors, and they'll look at them one time. This is maybe 10 minutes, because they don't have that much yet. Then the next night, maybe they get a few more. So they look through those, look back once at this. It just keeps going, keeps going. You're talking five or two minutes, five or two minutes. Even when you add in the other classes, maybe, maybe 20 or 30 minutes looking through the cards for every class. But this is all it ever gets. When the test is announced, nothing changes. They just keep doing it right up until the day of the test. And so what you're doing is you're constantly cycling. Tonight, Tonight, one time last night. Tonight, one time the other two nights, and so forth. Most of the time, by the time the test is announced, kids already know everything that they've had so far, and it's just more of a view. I was famous because I never told my kids when they had tests, ever. And I would announce as a parent meeting, I will not be telling your kids when their tests are because I wanted to force them into the system. And that's how I made the leap of them. The ones that got it, no problem. The kids who didn't, failed. And I spent the whole school year making believers out of them until they hit the end and were ready for middle school. And some kids, it takes that long before they get there. But the others realized when it worked. And I, we always had to turn in our grades at parish so that the administrators could kind of monitor this stuff. And my grades were always A's, high B's, and F's. I hardly ever had a C or a D. And that's because kids were either doing this or they weren't. And there wasn't a whole lot of middle grade. Okay. I just wanted to tell you that there are some parents here who have high school students. Yes, I know. And I'm ready to have their yes. high school back to school mates. So. This is a hand. I, might, I want to make sure you get this slide because this summarizes the whole program that I just went over in one graphic. I'll make sure you get that. All right. Thank you. What the email. Thank you. It should be on the front of your package. Yeah, it is. Email on the front of the package. Well, this is the slides that you would right here. Right here. Yeah, yeah, so if you have some slides, we can make them available to you. Mm -hmm. and we'll send them to yeah, amazing. Great. That was amazing. amazing. Thank you. All right, I just have a question for y'all. Did you, did you learn anything that you, this is what I always ask my kids, and Xander can attest to this, did you learn anything today that you did not already know? Yeah, yeah. Right. then it's not a waste of your time. <laughs> <laughs> number one, that that I, uh, is that, I did want to say one thing. So, many times I'll pick my kids up from school and I'll say, Do you have any homework tonight? And they always say, Oh, no, 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 we don't have anything. Once this program is implemented and being used, 
You always have time. Vendor cards. Vendor Winton. Yeah, but that's the way I was just party off. Good for me, right? Always something. NHW. Yes. Go find you. I just wanted to say a few things. First of all, thank you again for the flight team for Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And we're really excited to report. Thank you, Amy. I'm worried that they're going to play the music. Um, I just wanted to say that um, our teachers are actually learning this program as we move on, which is why we're phasing it in. And we've set up time for our teachers to meet with Lisa um, for, for the Hakim. They're going to meet with her like three or four times as well. And we're phasing it in stage one. So, um, so you might not see all of this. Uh, we've been very clear that not all of this is happening right, right. away. Um, we have Toba Reifman, um, who's, who's part of learning support, learning support, who's going to run point on this program in the middle school. And she got the program like sort of the first time and really uh, was able to take hold of it. So she's going to be one of our point people in the middle school helping with our teachers in terms of organizing it. Um, and I would, I just want to encourage you that really partnering in the success of your children uh, academically is, is so helpful for educators. And I think that at this stage, uh, the, what we can really use for you, I know for sure for our teachers, is that constructive feedback, right? Not uh, to be able to say to reach out to the teacher or to myself or to Toba and say, hey, my child's coming home and there's nothing written in their space. It doesn't say no homework. They're just saying they have no homework. And just that, maybe that reminder, just so that we're, we're on our toes and if we're all in this together collaboratively, it's gonna make the program so much more successful. And again, just that like teachers are learning this on the way as well. So it's part of the same educational process. Of One of the things that I think we could do, Tammy and Avi, is Maybe as I do each section with the teachers, we can say the highlighting is what we're focusing on now. To the so yeah, yeah. And then, really okay, okay, now we're working on graphic organizers. So that you don't have expectations yeah. that are unfair to the faculty as they're learning the program too. Because this is new to them as well. So we know what we need to go to Yachter now too. Thank yes. you, that was awesome. Yeah, please feel free to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer questions if you don't have a